Dr. Caitlin Zaloum is Associate Professor of Social and Cultural Analysis and Director of Metropolitan Studies at New York University. Lens through her PhD in anthropology from Berkeley, her areas of research are culture and economy, cities and globalization, financial markets, technology, uh, and social theory. Her writing has appeared in publications and collections such as American Ethnologist, The Hedgehog Review, Public Culture, American Quarterly, and others. That's a random sampling, I assure you, that I did not compile. She's the founding editor of Public Books and the author of Out of the Pits, Traders and Technology from Chicago to London. Forever the host of KUOW's award-winning news talk program, The Conversation, Long May It Rain. Ross Reynolds is now the station's executive producer of community engagement. In this role, he creates innovative and engaging community conversations such as the Ask Us series, in addition to stepping behind the mic for an interview whenever asked by the station or by us. They are here tonight to discuss Dr. Zaloom's book, Indebted, How Families Make College Work at Any Cost. Please join me in welcoming Ross Reynolds and Dr. Caitlin Zaloom. Um, just to kind of um, level set here, how many of you are paying off student loans or are parents paying off student loans, either or? Or looking, or looking forward to that soon, okay. All right, we're, we're calibrating. Um, uh, Caitlin's book is where I mentioned Indebted, How Families Make College Work at Any Cost. And um, you look at this by interviewing families that are going through the crisis of having to pay for the high-priced college education, but. Uh, Beyond an academic exercise, what's your personal interest in this topic? Yeah. <clears throat> well, my, my personal interest in the topic and my academic interest are actually very, very close. I was sitting in my office one day when a student knocked on my door. And of course, I teach at NYU, which is one of the most expensive uh, colleges in the country. But I still did not expect her to enter my office in tears just two weeks before her graduation. And this was a student who was one of the um, favorites I'd had during the many years that I've taught at NYU. And I thought she'd be going off into the world uh, facing lots and lots of opportunities to take jobs that she wanted to develop into the person that she wanted to be. But she was concerned um, not only that her life was going to be restricted by the loans she faced, but also that her mother at, was going to be incredibly disappointed that she wasn't going to be able to live the life that they had imagined for her. So it was not only a, a story about what Kimberly, my student, uh, was facing herself, but it was really a family story that went back um, not only to her mother, but to the possibilities that her mother's parents had even uh, been able to open up for her. The core of your book is about how a family's values are clashing with the moral mandates of what you call the student finance complex. I mean. Talk a little bit about the latter. What's the kind of moral mandates of the student finance complex? What do you mean by that? The moral mandates of the student finance complex uh, hide in plain sight. In fact, we oftentimes don't think of finance as having any kind of moral mandate at all. It is simply a technical um, response to a problem. You know, you have to, you have a, a very expensive thing to buy, like a house, and so a technical solution is that you go into debt to pay for it over many years, and the bank offers you a mortgage to solve this problem. That is not a moral mandate, at which, it, or at least it isn't in the kind of standard way of looking at the problem. As an anthropologist, though, I wanted to think about the messages that finance was sending to students and to families. First, that they needed to pay for college themselves, which is a new thing, actually, in the United States, uh, and that they were going to not only have to pay themselves, but they were going to have to pay this very high price. Those are moral mandates. Those are responsibilities that our university system and our financial system are sending to families that we need to recognize as 
moral obligations that people experience very personally rather than just seeing them as technical issues. And you say that this presents at least three problems for parents. First of all, when their children are young, they have to decide about spending on their present family needs and wants or saving for college. So how does this dilemma present and how does, what is, how does it deal with families? And we'll talk a little bit about your methodology after that. Sure. How you found that all this out is interesting. Yes, well, we present families with an essentially impossible situation. So on the one hand, we are telling families that they need to be saving for college sometimes in the earliest days after their children are born. You know, we tell them that they should be setting aside money for this goal that is 18 years out, that they should be planning. At the same time, we tell them that they need to be preparing their children um, in every way possible. And preparing means spending money. Uh, the first thing that they have to do, of course, is to buy very high-priced uh, childcare uh, because most likely, both parents work. The next thing that they have to do is to spend money to have their children go to a, a school in a school district where they can achieve, where they can get a good education. And of course, for many families, that means really stretching their budgets and paying a higher rent or paying more in a mortgage so that they, their kids can go to a decent um, school or the best school that they can go to. So those messages that families should both plan and prepare are at loggerheads with each other. And uh, so it shouldn't really be a surprise that families focus on the present needs uh, rather than on this long range goal, which honestly they can't um, really understand what the cost will be for a college education in 18 years anyway. And it has to be the right college. The other moral dilemma is no matter what the cost, it has to be the right college. And what kind of problems does that present for families? Families really want their children to be able to develop themselves in a direction that they choose, that the, that the this young adult, I mean, who is going off to college will be able to direct their own life. That's the, that's the goal. Um, they want a certain kind of independence for these young adults. And um, in some ways, that is the core of what being middle class means in the United States. So parents uh, who are in that position um, want to be able to give their kids the freedom that middle class people feel that they should be able to expect. And today, more than ever before, uh, college is essential for being able to kind of enjoy the possibilities of the, of the United States in terms of the, uh, having a decent and stable income and having some control over a person's life. And then the, where the third dilemma as you present is that parents are paying so much for their kids' college to ensure their kids' middle class status that they're actually th threatened with falling out of the middle class because of all these financial demands. That's right. It's a conflict that we're going to be seeing more and more of as the years go on um, from, from here. Parents are paying such high costs to send their children to college that it takes away from the money that they would be able to spend on their own retirement, the money that they would be able to put away now in hopes that it will grow in the, in the future um, to secure a life for themselves in, in their later years. Um, of course, they don't also want to talk to their children about that compromise because they don't want their, their children to feel burdened by the compromises that, the, the financial compromises that they are making as parents. They feel that it's their duty to make those compromises. You focus on middle class parents. First of all, define middle class. And then why did you look at that particular set? Yes. Um, so I define middle class in a different way than the usual way uh, because I'm very focused on college and on what the kind of rise of finance into this, uh, into at higher education has done to 
our lives in the United States, I wanted to pick a definition that was appropriate to that situation. So I define middle class as being too wealthy or having too much income to qualify for major federal higher education grants and not having enough money to pay for college in cash. That is the, the, the swath, <laughs> the very broad swath of, of, of Americans that, that I'm talking about. And you talked, to, you did 160 interviews with parents and with kids and learned that oftentimes the kids don't know that much about the finances at all. Um, um, how difficult was it to get people to open up and talk about money? Because we know that they'll talk about sex, they'll talk about everything before they talk about money. How hard was it to unlock that? Yes, that's the, that's the old joke that Americans will tell you more about their sex lives and their salaries, and it certainly goes for their debts and their finances as well. Uh, it was very hard uh, to, to find people who are willing to open up about their financial lives. Uh, it really required a lot of trust to expose themselves in that, uh, in that way. I mean, it really felt to people that they were um, showing their secrets. And this would oftentimes kind of come up in our interviews um, first that, that students didn't know very much about what their parents made, for instance, in terms of their incomes. Um, even within families, those silences were imposed very strongly. Now, when I was growing up, um, I'm a child of the 50s and 60s, and parents thought a college education would kind of deliver economic security and confidence in the future. Is that no longer the case? I think that today it's, it is quite different than in the 50s and 60s. When, um, when you went to college, or even when I, when I went to college uh, in, the, in the 1990s, there was a sense that college would pretty much ensure your ability to go out into the world, to find a job, to have a stable life. Um, it was a matter of kind of reproduction. So parents could, could help children have a similar life to what they had, um, hopefully somewhat better, but at least similar. Today, college is essential to giving kids a shot. So it's more that college is a kind of speculative endeavor for families, especially because they have to put down so much money today on the promise that something good might come out of it tomorrow. But in particular, debt puts that promise into, uh, in, into, into doubt um, whether or not young adults are going to be able to take the education that costs so much money and to actually live a life that they want to live is, uh, is in question. So in the past, maybe it was a guarantee. Today, it's a chance right. that you might be able to do that. Well, we're paying so much more for college now. It's amazing. It's multiples of what it was in the past. So we must be putting out a much better education, right? You're at NYU, so the education must be two or three times better than it was <laughs> when you and I were in college, right? <laughs> No. Oh, really? <laughs> uh, yeah, that's a, that's a completely reasonable question. And of course, we uh, oftentimes think that if something has a high price attached to it, it must be higher quality. But I mean, in, especially in our public education system, what we have today is, is uh, that states uh, across the country have been cutting higher education budgets um, uh, decade after decade, basically, uh, which means erosion of the, of the education. Um, and for instance, one of the, the trends that has happened alongside the rise in the cost of education, both at, at public and private universities, has been uh, the rise of, of using adjuncts in classrooms. Now, 
uh, adjuncts are oftentimes very dedicated teachers. They really want to give the best that they can give to their, to their students. Uh, but they are also paid very little and overburdened with the number of classes that they have to offer just to make a living. So even when you have uh, teachers who are incredibly focused on what they can give to students, it means that the education that students are getting um, is being led by someone who is simply overstretched. So if we're not paying for better education, if, the, if we're paying three, four, five times more and it's not going into the education, where's the money going? That is a great question. Um, one of the places that it's going is simply into operating universities. So when state legislatures cut university budgets, um, the universities have to get their money from somewhere to keep the lights on, to pay um, professors, whether they're adjunct or tenure track. Um, to, uh, to supply housing, all of those things, and they have to raise the funds to do that. Uh, another, another trend that has been happening, too, is the expansion of high-level, highly paid administrators at universities. So while on, uh, within the teaching staff, um, there has been uh, a turn toward using adjuncts to staff classes uh, at the upper tiers of the administration. There are more and more administrators than ever before. Does it still, um, well, with all this extra money that you have to pay to get an education in college, and that's only for the possibility of getting ahead, does that ever turn into people saying, you know, I'm not going to send my kid to college? And does that, is there ever any kind of consumer pressure to drive down costs? Mm -hmm. um, well, I think that the dynamic uh, that parents and, and students fa alike face is that they really do need an education to have a shot at a at a stable life and a, and a decent income um, today. And so that provides a kind of steady supply of, uh, of people who are willing, who are willing to pay. Um, I mean, right now, we're actually facing um, a decline in enrollments in universities, but that has to do with things like, um, you know, the, the, the demographics of generations, mm -hmm. um, rather than a kind of the, the willingness of people to, to pay. Well, the Department of Education set up a program to help students and have some of those loans forgiven. Not really working out, is it? No. I mean, one of the really important things that an education can give is for young adults to be able to figure out what they want to do, how they want to contribute to the world. And one of the major ways that they can do that is by being teachers, for instance. Um, and so the federal government set up a thing called the Public Service Loan Forgiveness Program. Um, and now that Public Service Loan Forgiveness Program, which should be available exactly to teachers and other people like them, certifies in the single digits people who apply for loan forgiveness. Um, and I think you know, rightly, they are now being sued by the American Federation of Teachers for access to that program. But I think that what it should uh, alert us to is that there is a much bigger, more fundamental problem with the cost of higher education. Uh, teachers should not be in the position of needing to sue the federal government to uh, to have their contribution to us all recognized. Um, in fact, teachers should be able to, or young adults who want to be teachers should be able to go into college knowing that, that they will be able to, to do that and to make their lives work out on the other side. Uh, many universities, including my employer, the University of Washington, tout programs that will pay the tuition of low-income students do you think these programs prevent price from being a barrier 
to kids coming from impoverished families to get into college and mm -hmm. to get on that ladder? Is that working that way? Yeah. Well, so in general, there is a problem of having low-income students not apply to places like the University of Washington or, say, the University of Michigan. Um, the, the flagship schools, there aren't enough um, low-income applicants. Um, and one of the factors that I think we don't think about enough is the way that the, a high sticker price for a college education is a signal to, uh, to, to children and to families as they are looking forward to the, the college years. So it must be for, good because it costs so much. Well, it must be good because it costs so much. I mean, so for instance, the sticker price for NYU this year, what it costs all in if you pay the full load is $76,000 a year. Wow. So it must be good because you pay so much, but also maybe not for you if you can't pay it. So I, I think that it's really important to think about what prices signal to aspiring, uh, aspiring students. I think we really need to take that into account. And um, for instance, I, um, I have in my family uh, my stepfather who grew up as a poor kid in the Bronx, um, but who had City College, which was you know, then known as the Harvard of the, of the poor, to aspire to. He had you know, parents who were not themselves educated and who were not particularly supportive, but he knew that it was there free for him if he could succeed in school. And that was essential. Uh, and today, I don't think that he would look certainly at NYU and the $76,000 and think, oh yeah, that's going to be there for me when I need it. Uh, so I think we need to think about the messages that we're sending to both low-income and middle-class students who want to attend college but who might not think that those colleges are really there for their benefit. I mean, I've seen the argument that um, elite schools, notwithstanding their funding for low-income students, are actually aggravating the gap between the rich and the poor, that most of those students come from parents with high incomes. So it's not really leveling at all. It's actually increasing the divergence we have between rich and poor. Do you see that to be the case? Yes. So the, the, the statistics um, show that the very elite schools have more very wealthy students or students from very wealthy families than other, than other schools. So if you happen to be low income and happen to, to have um, someone who has encouraged you to apply and you get into Princeton, um, you will be better off. But that is a very small number of people. I think we need to be focusing on our public colleges and universities and strengthening those systems so that the um, so that the families in in all of our states know that they have a really good place to go um, and it, that it isn't only going to be Princeton that will give them opportunities. Well, let's talk about some ideas for solutions. There's an estimated 1.5 trillion dollars in student loan debt. Some think there to be a huge economic benefit just by forgiving all that debt. Is that a solution? That is certainly one solution, and it's a very important idea. I mean, it's an important idea in part because uh, student debt is born um, by people along all of the fissures of, of the inequalities in our country. If you are a person of color, if you're a woman, you carry more debt than your white male counterparts. So in part, if you forgive that debt, you will, you will be supporting um, people who have historical disadvantages. Um, you'll also be um, supporting, uh, I mean, the, the, the detractors for this plan will say like, okay, well, you're also forgiving the debt of doctors and dentists and, and others who now make uh, a, a, a very good living. Um, but I personally think that if we um, support doctor, you know, the people who are going on to be doctors and, and 
dentists and others who would make a good living, um, we are creating a kind of supply uh, for, for the rest of us. We all need general practitioners. We all need dentists. Um, that is an essential part of what education is for, not only to benefit a kind of private people, but actually to help the, all the people in our communities that you know, give us what we need. As we're speaking, the Democratic presidential candidates are, are debating. And before we started, you were looking at your phone to figure out if they were going to be talking about student <laughs> debt. Um, what proposals yeah. do you see out there from the Democratic candidates, and how do you evaluate those proposals? Yeah. Well, so, so debt forgiveness is, uh, is certainly one of them from um, Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren. Um, even, I, I mean, so I, I think that debt forgiveness is, is an interesting uh, is an interesting proposal, but the thing that I think is the most important is actually uh, the, the thing that goes by the name free college. Of course, college is like free isn't really um, what it would be, but it would, but the idea would be that it would be state supported. And, and I think that one of the reasons why that's an interesting idea is because we have already had it in our history. Um, you know, you don't have to go back all of that far to a time when public higher education was free or so low cost that it essentially amounted to like a nice dinner for your family. I mean, I, I went to, uh, to UC Berkeley for my graduate studies and, uh, and even into the 1980s, uh, Berkeley was so low cost that people didn't even really think about it. Um, and that was true for the, for the uh, entire University of California system. Today, that is no longer true. And it's quite a different thing to begin your life as a young person um, free of debt than it is to start life as a young person uh, with, with tens of thousands of dollars, in fact, an average of $30,000 in, uh, in loans. So I think that, that getting back to free or very low cost college is essential. I guess, but someone pays, right? Uh, the, uh, someone, if we're gonna forgive $1.5 trillion in debt, who eats the cost of that? And if we're going to provide a free college education, who, who pays the cost of that? Right. Well, so so first of all, um, states used to pay for it, um, and they, uh, in general, don't. Um, actually, the Washington state has has increased its contribution to um, to higher education recently, which is a good move. Um, but that is not true across the country uh, at, at, at all. And in fact, um, there have been major cuts even just since 2008. So when I say that that someone, you know, someone has to pay, it should, it should be the state. And one of the things that I think is really remarkable about this debate is that we talk about redistribution in higher education, you know, that, that uh, rich people should pay more, poor people should pay less, middle class people should pay somewhere in the middle. That's essentially an argument about redistribution. Um, it, it is remarkable to me that we talk about that in higher education, but we don't talk about it as freely in our taxation system, which is where conversations about redistribution belong. Higher education should be for educating people, taxes are for redistribution. It's a, it's a very funny, um, it's a very funny marker of the moment that we're in that education is the place where we can talk about who should pay what? But if we had a taxation system that actually worked the way that it is supposed to work, then um, then states could pay for higher education, and we wouldn't be having this particular debate. And what would that taxation system look like? Well, it, I mean, it would it would mean that that rich people paid more in taxes. Mm. <laughs> That's. I mean, it becomes a calculation right now. I mean, you said it used to be a guarantee of a middle class chance in life, and now a college education is a chance at a middle class. So how are students or parents who are entering into these enormous debts 
to calculate that? How are, they, how are they to calculate the return on investment? I mean, it, it is in a way an investment, and we could talk about other reasons for higher education, but in one sense, in a purely economic sense, they're putting out this much money in the hope that they'll get this much back. How do you make that calculation? Yeah, well, the idea that, that people are supposed to make a calculation like that, I think is an, is an issue in itself. I mean, that's part of the moral mandate uh, that, that we were talking about. The, that, in fact, we're supposed to approach education as a question of, of return on investment. So, you know, the, the imagination of that is, the, is that you're supposed to, um, to figure out what you want to be, to find some average salary, to back, then back out the cost of the education that you're going to get and somehow come up with uh, a balanced notion of, of, of how much you should pay. But first of all, that assumes that yourself at 18 is going to know what you want to do, highly unlikely, um, that you will be able to predict what your salary is going to be, spurious, um, and that even uh, even before college, that you're going to even know uh, the, the the exact sums that you're going to have to pay, which actually change between year one and year four for 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 students today uh, more often than not. So all of this really throws that uh, that idea of calculation um, out of out of whack. Uh, but there is a real strong kind of moral position that policymakers take that people should do that. That is how they should think about, about their education when, in fact, it doesn't even really make mathematical sense unless you're taking averages, which is what policymakers do, but not what regular people do. So it's become much more of an economic calculation, but what should higher education be for? Well, I think higher education should be for young adults figuring out what they're interested in and how they want to contribute. And that takes all kinds of forms. It takes choosing classes and having a, um, an experimental approach to their educations because they don't know what they want to do when they're 18, nor should they. Um, and, and what college should be for is creating an opportunity to explore that universe both in terms of subjects and also socially. You know, education should be for creating an environment where young people can come together to kind of figure out where they're gonna take us. And they're not gonna be able to, to, to do that if what we're giving them is this kind of limited calculation of, well, you know, it's really just about your, your job on the way out. Uh, private for-profit schools are kind of coming in on this value calculation saying, we can offer you the same thing for less and we'll get you into a nice high paying job. How does that figure into this discussion of what higher education should be? Yeah, well, high, for, the for-profit actors are the, uh, or the for-profit colleges are the absolutely worst actors in this whole sector. Um, they take money from students, uh, they deliver a very dubious quality of education and more often than um, should be possible. Students do not actually graduate with a degree, which means that they are saddled with debt that they, they, that they cannot then pay off. Um, so for-profit colleges are, are very um, unfortunate feature of the higher education landscape. Is anyone onto that yet? I mean, you say they're taking the students' money, but actually the students are borrowing are borrowing the money to pay these yes, schools. Yes, yes. Well, the, right. So they're, they're, taking, yeah. they're taking federal dollars right. that flow through the students into the coffers of, uh, of the for-profit universities and then onto the pockets of their investors. Um, so, so, so yes, um, people are onto that. The, the Obama administration actually was making strides in constraining the, the for-profit sector and actually getting some debt relief for students who, um, who, whose 
colleges had acted fraudulently toward them, I mean, essentially lying to them about the kinds of jobs that they could get uh, once they graduated from, from these places. Um, and, uh, and uh, you know, that has been, um, let's just say, contentious in the current uh, Department of Education. I was going to say, what about the last three years? Is, is that effort to try to bring the for-profit schools that might be just taking this loan money and not really giving a good education, is the effort to try to straighten that out still happening, or has it been discontinued under the current administration? Oh, uh, well, Betsy DeVos uh, is a proponent of the for-profit colleges. She has brought in um, people from the for-profit colleges into the Department of Education, and, uh, and so, <laughs> It's not only been suspended, but but reversed. Um, it's yeah, it's 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 a it's a very strained and uh, and and really terrible situation. Most people aspire to have their children go to a college, a four-year college of some kind. But I wonder if our one of the distortion of our values isn't that sometimes parents look down on the fact that there are a lot of jobs that don't require a four-year college. There are jobs in the trades. There are jobs where you actually build things with your hands rather than just think of things in your mind that can be incredibly satisfying for people. And I've always kind of thought that we've, we unfairly dismiss those. And I wonder what your thoughts are on that. Are there other forms of education which could be just as rewarding? Hey, I built that because I know how to build things, but are yet are not valued in our society. Do we look down on blue collar work and when we really should think of that as another option for folks? Right, so I, I think that, that um, you know, plumbers and other kinds of blue collar workers are contributing just as much as, as anyone else to um, to our lives and to, to our communities. The issue is about what kind of education we offer uh, people who want to go into those trades. Um, and the, the trade education that I hope for um, in, that, in that space is one that not only trains people for doing the kind of jobs that we need them to do kind of right now, but also helps them um, figure out ways to present the kinds of innovations and technical knowledge that they will be developing um, as they do their jobs. I mean, so so it should be a kind of virtuous cycle uh, where where people who are in the trades can then contribute and and help those trades evolve. And education should be a a really important piece of that. It's interesting to me how technology is working itself into the trades too. I was at some small manufacturing plants in South Seattle and you walk in and there's a giant machine and it bends pieces of metal and there's a computer right next to it. They, they have to know how to use that computer to make that machine do that simple mechanical tasks. So a lot, and the employers that I spoke to said, we can't find people here because the, the high schools here are not graduating people qualified to do what we need them to be able to do. We have to go to the Midwest where there are better trade schools to get qualified people here, which mm -hmm. struck me as, 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 as a shame. Yeah, well, well certainly, I mean, I, I, I wonder, I think that one, um, one situation that points to is that employers really need to be investing in their people and training them. I mean, part of the shift in higher education has been to ask um, workers to take on the burden of their own training. Um, that's what uh, going into the Midwest to search for people is really about. It's, it's not that they can't find people, it's that they can't find people who've already borne the cost of their own training. So perhaps those companies should be training the people that are here. I want to go to questions in a moment, but we're portraying kind of a bleak picture here of higher education that's become, becoming less affordable, parents going deeply into debt to pay for it, an education in the department that doesn't seem to be paying enough attention to some of these issues. Are there, do you see any bright spots on the horizon? You spoke to these 160 yeah. parents and children. Do you see some light at the end of the tunnel? Well, I think that the light at the end of the tunnel is that parents and students alike are incredibly committed to this very fundamental piece of our lives. I mean, education is not only for getting jobs. It is also for expanding our horizons. It's for 
honestly, reinventing our democracy. That was one of the original ideas of John Dewey from the beginning of the 20th century, and it remains true today. Um, we want people to be able to not only do what they can do for themselves, but also what they can do for all of us. And uh, parents and students alike who I spoke with uh, really believed in that vision. I mean, they might not put it exactly that way, but, but that was the, the direction. So the issue to me is that we have to, in fact, kind of take the fetters off. Um, and, and there is some movement in that direction uh, at the state level. For instance, in New Mexico, now the governor has proposed making college free for all, uh, all citizens of New Mexico. Um, in New York State, we have uh, something called the Excelsior Program, which is supposed to make uh, college tuition free for families that, uh, that make $125,000 or, or less. Um, the, the program is a bit of a disaster, but it's at least a step in the right direction. Uh, and, and there are other programs like this around the country. The issue today is to really kind of keep that momentum going. Uh, and I think that, that young people really recognize uh, the, that what, what is happening. I mean, not only do they feel it personally, but they understand the politics of it. And so I think that the bright spot on the horizon is that, uh, that people who are now in their 20s and 30s um, are going to help us change things. Would you give me your name, sir, and tell us what your question is? Mason Blatcher. I am, in fairness, a fundraising consultant in higher education. <laughs> I worked at a little place across the bay in Palo Alto for many years um. as director of major gifts. I do this for a number of smaller colleges, which I think deserve some recognition in this conversation. Smaller private colleges are major contributors to higher education of first generation, historic, uh, historically black, uh, Hispanic serving institutions, while you look at a high sticker price of NYU, the fact is the discounting that takes place thanks to funded scholarships as well as unfunded discounts are putting students through school. The thing we're, that we'd agree on is the average student debt of 30, I'd say 32,000, which was the last and most recent price of a Volkswagen Beetle. When I graduated from school a long time ago, my student loan was $2,000, which at the time was the price of a Volkswagen Beetle. Uh, the, the price of tuition loans has not been uh, horribly, uh, has not been horrible. The, the indebtedness due to the parent plus, plus loans where parents are spending and students are spending more money than they should on non-tuition, and where the um, for-profit colleges are inducing, seducing students into uh, promises that they cannot possibly fulfill. We agree again. Uh, these are the culprits. I work with many smaller colleges who charge 25,000 tuition, but even 30, 32,000, but the average tuition cost per student is 13,000 because the schools are discounting. If, as you suggest, uh, public colleges ought to be free, which would cost the taxpayers a lot of money, you'll destroy those private colleges utterly. I don't think that would be a good thing for our economy. Um, so that, so the, the issue about the sticker price and the discounts is, is one that comes up a lot. Um, but I, you know, I think that I think we have to take the sticker price and the sort of messaging that it's, it, it puts forward seriously. Um, families pay uh, based on a few things. Um, first, 
how they are measured on the free application for federal student aid. That is the that is the first kind of measurement. This is a kind of measurement that actually families don't believe takes into account uh, their financial responsibilities. And a close look at something like the the FAFSA form, which is the doorway to aid um, both uh, both federal and uh, and often school based, is uh, is tilted toward a kind of nuclear family that does not represent how people live today. So it really measures responsibilities between parents and children. It does not, for instance, measure responsibilities between parents and grandparents for, wh for whom they have to support in their later years unless those parents have been declared dependents legally. So the question of how much parents pay, whether they can quote unquote, afford it or not, is based on measurements that are out of whack with how people live. Now, um, if we want to talk about kind of smaller private colleges, um, yes, if we made public colleges free, um, smaller private colleges would probably be a less attractive option. Um, that isn't particularly my concern, although it is certainly a concern for smaller private colleges. Um, but I think that we need to be thinking about the larger, uh, the, the kind of larger canvas rather than about specific you, you uh, seem, sectors. You seem to be saying the concerns of smaller private colleges, and there are many, they're supposedly an endangered species, are somewhat parochial interests when it comes to the large big picture here? Um, I, well, yes. Okay. That's what I would say. Other questions? Yes, what's your name and what's your question? Hi, uh, my name is Isha, and uh, just to put it out there, I'm actually a graduate and employee of NYU. <laughs> um, but my question to your earlier point about how families who are rich are able to send their uh, children to elite schools, if we were to make public colleges free, or if we were to give them more substantial funding than we do right now, my assumption there would still be, okay, well, these families that can afford to send their places to places like NYU or to Ivy League institutions that do have a higher sticker price, how would it not then exacerbate the difference between the rich and the, and the poor who would only, and I'm using air quotes there, have the option to send their kids to public schools which may not have the same brand recognition and ability to network your way into a better job? Mm -hmm. uh, so I think, I think that, that is a, that's a very good question. And I think that the view, um, so the, the conversation is oftentimes based on a view from kind of particular areas in the country. Um, and certainly, um, the, the view from the, from the East Coast focuses a lot on the private universities. The view from California is different. Um, and so having been um, a graduate student at the University of California, you know, I saw this up close in many ways. And in California, you know, there isn't really this idea that you have to, if you don't send your kid to a private college, that that's a problem. Um, I mean, you know, Stanford uh, and uh, it, uh, several uh, others aside at this at that elite tier, um, you know, that that does not take away from UC Berkeley, UCLA, UC San Diego, um, and and the many other schools in the UC and also even in the Cal State system. So I, I don't think that, that they necessarily have to break down along those along those lines. We have another question. What's your name and what's your yeah. question? Uh, Scott Lawrence. So this is an interesting discussion. I came here on purpose because I'm pretty alarmed at the amount of student debt nationwide. I don't see an end to this. Uh, my nephew graduated law school, I think, about five years now. And he was put on this program for government reimbursement. Mm -hmm. so he's gone into public. Mm -hmm. uh, he's a public defender. So I'm hopeful for him. It's 100000 or so. I think he's in debt. Um, but aside from that, I went to UC uh, Santa Barbara at $50 a quarter when it started. I graduated, it was $250. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. Well, so now I'm, you know, luckily a resident of Washington and Seattle for a long time, and I've watched UW grow and grow and grow. And I'm amazed at the campus because the buildings and the, the construction is just top of the line. I mean, very expensive buildings, very expensive everything. And as an alum, I'm tagged every year to make a contribution back to my school, which I do. But I earmark my funds for the students. And it seems to me that a lot of major donors, and they keep growing every year, are contributing hundreds and maybe in the billions of dollars back to these high-end schools, of which I would say UW is. And I don't see the money going to students. I don't see it going to, you know, lower this horrible debt that we're seeing. Instead, I think it's going into these really fancy, huge, ever-increasing, high-rise um, capital construction projects. And I would like to see that changed. I think that's a source of major funding that comes from people with means right from the get-go. We don't have to redistribute through taxes. We don't have to ask colleges to redo their budgets and you know, kind of rearrange it that way. We've got a huge funding source, and it's ever-increasing. But it's not being spent in a way that really contributes to the public good. It allows someone who's wealthy to put their name on a building, on a plaque, or whatever, and, you know, feel some type of satisfaction from that. I'm seeing that as something that could be a major source of funding to help correct the problem, because I think we have a huge problem, and it's, it's a train that's racing down the track. I see no end to it. I mean, do you see universities as being responsible for convincing those major donors not to put their name yeah, on the building, I think but it instead has, put it somewhere else? Somebody has to put their foot down. And at some point, the boards, however the structure of the universities are, we have to say, look, we need to convince our donors that, you know what, our money would be better spent with our student populations, with helping our country go forward. I mean, we're, you know, this is just going to get a lot worse. That's why you're here and you wrote the book. I really see that. And, um, you know, so I'm glad you're raising the issue. And, and But I think it really needs to that part needs to be addressed. And I think that needs to take some real political clout and a change in, in the culture to do it. Because I don't, I don't see there any, yeah. any signs that they're doing that. So, yeah. so could well, universities be more forceful in getting major donors to direct that money to education rather than buildings? Right. Well, that's very, that's very tricky. And it's one of the reasons why philanthropy is a difficult uh, vehicle to satisfy these kind of these very large problems. I mean, so... If, but there, there are some, um, there are some, you know, good movements in this direction. I mean, for instance, UCLA just received a ten million dollar gift uh, targeted to supporting um, tuition for middle class students. That was a, that was a major gift, but uh, but. Ten million dollars um, doesn't do anything uh, in the in the UC system apart from the specific students that it will help. the the uh, The purpose of gifts like that, I believe, uh, should be to signal that there is a real issue that is systemic. Not that uh, not that ten million dollars is enough. I mean, and that's a that's a big gift. Uh, and so, and we also saw that kind of gift um, with the Morehouse students um, at graduation in spring of 2019 with a donor who came in and wiped out the debt of the, of the graduating class. That was wonderful. It's an amazing gift for those young men. Um, but it's not for beyond those young men. So even when it works to have philanthropy support exactly what you're talking about, support students um, in you know, not leaving college with burdensome debt, uh, it, it ends very quickly. Um, so while I think that you're completely right that, uh, that university um, fundraisers should be focusing on support for students, um, even when, it, even when that works well, it's, it's limited, and that's going to be a small number of donors who are interested in that specific, uh, that specific kind of gift. 
Caitlin can hang out um, afterwards, so we'll take one more question and then we'll close off the public part, but she'll be around to answer other questions. Go ahead. Uh, so you talked about a couple of different things. You talked about the idea of planning for the future while also spending on the present in terms of raising children. Um, and you talked about the sort of elitism, again, air quotes, of some of the private institutions or just institutions that have a high sticker price, not being able to recruit from lower income communities as successfully as they should. Um, working sort of in the admissions space, which is a little bit of my background, I've noticed kind of like a slap in the face that the more that colleges are getting competitive, the more that lower income communities are disproportionately affected by that because they can't pay for the Kaplan course on SAT tutoring plus the person to help them write their essay that's gonna convince everyone to take them plus sending them to a college preparatory school plus et cetera, et cetera. So I was wondering if you could comment um, a little bit on that piece of the planning for now with the big high sticker price pieces um, and how it, inf in it affects those lower income communities, even applying, um, or, or sorry, not even applying, even being considered competitive in these institutions. Yeah, there, there's so many ways that the dynamics uh, you're talking about play out with, with low income communities. Um, even with the, uh, the free application for federal student aid, um, which, you know, it has the word free in it uh, as a, to, to kind of signal to low-income people that they can, that they can uh, apply for aid that way. Um, the FAFSA form itself is a barrier for, for both parents um, to fill it out and for students to go to college and stay in college. So, uh, so not only do we have high-stakes testing, not only do we have... Uh, do we have applications that are bolstered by all of the forms of preparation, um, like you know, high-priced music lessons, sports teams, you know, travel to you know low-income countries to kind of burnish up an application with some volunteerism um, that upper middle class and wealthier people engage in all the time? Um, but we have these very um, very kind of seemingly mundane to middle class people, but, uh, but are, are absolutely a kind of essential barriers for low income people to get over, just like just filling out the forms, for instance, which presume a whole host of very middle class skills, uh, a middle class relationship to bureaucracy, for instance, like you actually have to think that bureau bureaucracy is there to support you, which is not what a lot of low income people feel at all. Um, in fact, they um, rightly feel that bureaucracy is there to, to punish them. Um, and if we don't take those barriers away, there will always be, uh, there, there will always be this kind of artificial uh, pressing down on the kinds, uh, on the numbers of low-income students who have access to higher education. The book is called Indebted, How Families Make College Work at Any Cost. Caitlin Zalums, thanks so much. Thank you.